the organizers have, organizers have to tell me you now when to start. We still have three minutes. Couple of minute of your introduction. Yeah, I know. I can say hello to Ramsar before that. Yeah, yeah, sir. Hello, Satya Mutti. Actually, I saw you. <laughs> Good to, see, good, to good to see you. Yeah. A quick question. Tell me which is the place to read about formation of elements beyond the hydrogen, helium, and lithium in the stellar dynamics? You can send me a mail or I will send you a mail. Yeah, yeah. You send I will reply. It's not a uh, Oh, you want some book, it means? Book, article, whatever, at the elementary okay. level. Yeah. Okay. I'll send you a mail. I need. I Hello, everyone. Uh, we will uh, start the uh, our second day program of uh, National Science Day week celebration here at Manipal Center for Natural Sciences, uh, part of Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, we have uh, just for the information, we have uh, streaming this on in our auditorium. So all our local crowd, our members of MCNS are all here in the auditorium. Plus, we are also streaming it live uh, on MS Teams as well as YouTube uh, for uh, others uh, for others benefit or others can join. Uh, I will first invite our director of our center, uh, Professor Patiraj, to introduce uh, Dr. Astana and take the program, share the program. Thank you, Dr. Srijit. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the fourth lecture in the 14 lecture series that we had lined up uh, for this week uh, to commemorate the Science Day. <clears throat> I am happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Praveer Astana. He is a PSA fellow in the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor, Government of India. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Astana uh, in BST um, from 2015 to 2018. That was the last leg of my service. And then I superannuated in 2018. Uh, Dr. Astana is a very uh, articulate person, sincere very meticulous and above all human. Uh, so we had a very wonderful relationship working together. And uh, coming to his uh, brief uh, CV, uh, Dr. Astana, after completing his master's in Punjab University, Chandigarh, moved to University of Alberta in Canada and completed his master's and PhD in theoretical particle physics. On return from Canada, after a couple of brief stints, he joined the Department of Science and Technology in the year 1989. He occupied several positions in the department. He rose from SSO 1 to, he rose up to advisor DST and uh, had uh, taken responsibility to uh, kind of uh, uh, service several programs in the DST. Some of the programs that Dr. Rastana was associated with are 
initially it was the program advisory committee in physical sciences that is where we nurture a lot of scientific research happening in that specific area uh, through um, independent researchers so he was involved with that program for nearly 15 years or so and then he was the architect for nano mission he prepared the program document and then he got the approval from planning commission and other things and then launched the program then he was the head of the mega science division uh, where he facilitated India's participation in several of the uh, international um, mega science programs that are happening, which we see like LHC in CERN, FAIR, EMT, SKA, LIGO, etc. He also was heading the Autonomous Institutions Division and he brought in several good. Um, changes the management of autonomous scientific bodies and uh, he one of the things that he developed was the resource allocation using a quantitative performance measurement and um, he also established certain large scale research infrastructures like the 3.6 telescope at Devastar and such other uh, scientific infrastructures. <clears throat> he was also involved initially with the INSPIRE program, but later it was transferred. He was quite uh, good in his English, so he was used by the department to draft the science technology policy. 203. Then also he was involved in establishment of science and engineering research board um, as an autonomous body. He brings with him a very rich experience in science administration and management and currently he is leading the national mega science vision 2035. This is an exercise of the principal scientific advisors office. I have great pleasure in inviting him to deliver today's talk on mega science program in India, evolution and prospects. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, Dr. Astana. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Prithviraj, um, for a rather generous introduction. And uh, anyway, the title of my talk today is uh, circulated and a very brief abstract. So I won't repeat any of that, uh, except that uh, the title uh, Mega Science Program uh, is very dear to my heart. And uh, this is something that I did for all my career in DST. Uh, so I hope I'll be able to uh, transmit some of the excitement and challenges that I had on the way uh, while handling this program. So uh, let me start uh, right away. I have to share your uh, Yes, yes, I have to share. Yeah, sorry, it will uh, Just one sec. Just screen share, just one sec. Entire screen. Just one second, let me see. Just hold it there.
Can you all see this now? Yeah, it's visible. Full screen is visible. It's okay. Can you see the full screen also? Yeah. It's perfect. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> so this is the title of my talk, which all of you know. So I'll proceed from here. Now, uh, as the title of the talk suggests, I am going to talk about mega science program. So the first question that arises is, then what do we mean by mega science program? Now I am going to uh, say that mega science program is is the same as mega science projects. Uh, see, it's a collection of mega science projects, and sometimes colloquially we call this mega science program as mega science. And many times uh, people actually put a hyphen in between. Now I personally feel that uh, mega science or mega hyphen science is not quite correct because there is nothing mega or micro about science. Science is science whether it's done in petri dish or at large hadron collider. So what we mean by mega science program is a collection of mega science projects. So I thought I'll first settle that. Now then. Uh, let me try to define what mega, mega science program is. Uh, before mega science program, uh, since it is a collection of mega science projects, uh, let me uh, point out what mega projects are. Then I'll come to mega science pro projects. Now, are mega projects that um, uncommon? And the answer that I'm going to give you is that they are not. For example, we all know, we hear every day about highways, expressways, metro projects, bullet train, and so on. Now, we can all think of these as mega engineering projects. So, uh, here the basic science and technology is known, and then we do engineering with it, and we build these magnificent things. Then we hear about these uh, you know, the projects on breeder reactors, on cryogenic engine various defense projects, LCA, and this main battle tank, and so on. And I have also put in ITER there. Uh, so these, I will call uh, mega technology projects. And once these projects are finished, you have demonstrated a technology which can then subsequently be used for production. Now, ITER I have put in, I mean, um, and I'll come to that later. Uh, this is an international thermonuclear experimental reactor where we are trying to demonstrate that if we put in 50 megawatts of power, we will get about 500 megawatts of uh, uh, fusion, uh, power from fusion. So it's again a technology demonstrator, but uh, we often count it as mega science project. Then we come to some projects like the Large Hadron Collider, the facility for anti-proton and ion research, the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, and so on. Now, these projects I will call as mega science projects because once these projects are completed, what we do with these uh, great instruments is to study various aspects of science. So, uh, these, um, it's, it's better to call these as mega science projects. Now, this does not mean that any of these three classes is superior or inferior to the other one. Now, all these three classes of projects, mega projects, involve a complex mix of science, technology, and engineering. None is superior than the other. Um, but when we keep the ultimate use of these um, things, then uh, the identification becomes uh, clearer. And um, so, but it is very important to uh, look at these three different classes of projects because often they are confused. And then uh, especially the amount of resources that are going into one project or the other becomes a point of debate. So I thought I'll first uh, uh, agree on these definitions and then proceed forward. So let me now move uh, to the definition of mega science, mega science projects, and I'm jumping the chronology a little bit. In the Indian context, it was in the 11th plan period, uh, 2007 to 2012, that the uh, there was a steering committee on science and technology constituted by the then planning commission. And this was the first time that mega science projects were identified as a separate class in the science and technology plan. And uh, the, this is a chapter seven of the steering committee report. And it defined mega science projects as follows. And please allow me to read this because this is a very interesting definition. 
It says mega science project should appeal to the scientific curiosity of the researchers in search of answers to some of the important questions facing the world of science and should be of interest to a large scientific community from various research groups within the country and outside. Then it goes on to say that mega science projects would be very large in terms of outlays or the complexity involved. Thus a user group, institution or individual countries would need to join hands with other similarly interested groups. Implementation of such projects would involve multi-institutional teams, including possible international collaboration. So this is the way um, the uh, Steering Committee on Science and Technology in the 11th plan defined mega science project. And I personally feel that it's a very beautiful definition. I was lucky enough to be part of this entire deliberation. And um, so we will proceed and we'll uh, base our discussion on this definition. So if I were to point out the characteristics of mega science projects, now what are those? Okay. Um, they are usually of large size, but they need not be of large size. And when I'm talking of large, just keep uh, the large hadron collider as a typical example of a mega science project, because this is something that has happened in recent times. So we all know what it is. Then these projects uh, require large capital, financial, and human resources. Uh, then uh, they have high degree of technical complexity. I've just taken it from the definition. And the interesting thing here is that uh, building these projects uh, involves technologies that are not off the shelf. It is not as if we can just tender and get these equipment and put them together. In fact, these um, projects push the technology frontiers themselves. And one needs to do considerable upfront R&D in the technologies, underlying technologies, to be able to realize these um, projects. Then uh, some, uh, the next one, which I have colored in red, is very important. And, uh, uh, and this is something which is quite, which is common to almost all the mega science projects, but they are manifestly collaborating. Uh, they involve a large number of scientists, engineers, technicians, technical managers, institutions, industries, funding agencies. And uh, as a corollary, corollary, the science that they deliver is of interest to a large community of scientists around the world. Now, very often these projects are also international. They need not be international, but very often these days they are international. Okay. Now, let me get back to the chronology uh, and uh, point, uh, point out how India slowly got engaged with these mega science projects over, a, over several decades. Now, India's engagement with these projects has taken place within a specific scientific and socioeconomic context. Uh, see, the first discipline in physics, or I think in all of sciences, which got the experience of uh, mega science projects was high energy physics. And uh, because as all of you know, high energy physics or particle physics aims to look at the most elementary constituents of matter and how they interact. And so one has to go inside matter to find out what is there in, you know, one has to go inside the matter to find out what is there inside. So uh, one needs to have higher and higher energies uh, projectiles and targets, um, sometimes the targets also move, projectiles also move, as in collider experiments. So we need higher and higher energy particles. So we need large, bigger and bigger accelerators to do that. And uh, so high energy physics uh, went on from one high energy accelerator to the other. I mean, as all of us realize, this is just essentially a repeat of Rutherford kind of experiment with higher and higher energy, at higher and higher energies with more and more sophisticated instrumentation. Now, um, when high energy physics started to become bigger and bigger, our individual scientists and our institutions started collaborating with their um, uh, colleagues abroad in the high energy physics accelerator laboratories there. So the scientists to scientists collaboration with CERN dates back to the 1960s. Now, in those days, what our scientists used to do, they will go there, they'll expo, they'll get either the bubble chamber, cloud chamber photographs, 
or they will get the exposed emulsions and uh, then they will bring those things here those essentially pictures and look look at them under microscope and, and do analysis of the tracks etc and carry out their research these were so the experiments were online but the data analysis was offline now slowly the particle physics experimentation moved to online experiments with the data obtained electronically and uh, india also got involved in those experiments and uh, for the first time india contributed some software hardware for the lep experiments of cern in the late 70s and 80s but it was the agreement of cooperation between cern and government of india in 1991 and the cern india protocol in 1996 which actually uh, marked the beginning of uh, india's major engagement with mega science projects and um, india agreed to contribute machine and detector components for lhc and this was the turning point in india's engagement with mega science projects now in between something else also happened india built some uh, large uh, piece of scientific instrumentation in the country gmrt was built the uti radio telescope was built and i think we could demonstrate that we could build equipment of international quality and at perhaps a relatively lower cost so uh, several things happened around this time you know by 1990s that our scientific capabilities in supplying sophisticated hardware with international specifications benchmarks and timelines got noticed our industry also got involved in producing some of those components and the indian particle physics and accelerator physics community got together formed well structured collaborations like their international counterparts but in parallel there were some other socio economic developments which were taking place and if you remember it was in 1991 that the indian economy opened with globalization and liberalization india's technological drive also got noticed in the it software sector and india has started recording good economic growth and had relatively better resources available for everything including for science and technology and in between uh, big scientific collaborations also became a common place in other areas of science for example we had the human genome project then synchrotron radiation sources became an invaluable tool for research in material science and biology and so on so it was no more uh, limited to only high energy physics or particle physics and it was around this time so these things became a more common place and that is why uh, the planning commission in the 11th five year plan period decided to identify mega science projects as a separate class and uh, then gave the definition that i talked about okay so here is a list of mega projects or mega science projects i have removed the word science deliberately because i have put iter here also uh, in the list because at the moment i think in the uh, you know in uh, we consider iter as a part of uh, mega science project so i have removed the science on the top so what are the may, uh, most notable uh, mega science projects or mega projects that we are participating uh, today in today uh, the large hadron collider is the uh, is the most obvious one it is a big accelerator facility at geneva as we all know then we are participating in this facility for anti proton and ion research at darmstadt in germany now this is where the old gsi uh, lab is located and as some of you may know gsi has to its credit many new elements on the periodic table in fact one of them them is known as darmstadium after the darmstadt place Um, where it is located then 30 meter telescope india based neutrino observatory which is now called kuttipuram uh, research laboratory ligo india project the square kilometer array iter i, uh, I mentioned then there is another project uh, called high intensity superconducting proton accelerator this is a technology demonstrator uh, project between india and fermi lab and which is going on astrosat is already there as we all know this is also a mega science project now uh, we have just commissioned a large gamma ray telescope called mace 
at Halle in Ladakh. And uh, there are uh, aspirations to build a National Large Solar Telescope, Radioactive Ion Beam Facility, National Large Telescope, Optical Telescope, High Brilliance Synchrotron Radiation Source, Spallation Neutron Source, so on uh, and so on. So I think we are getting more ambitious and uh, at the end of the talk, I would have proven uh, before you that there is every reason for us to be ambitious. Okay. So uh, and now I'll mention only a few things about a few of these projects because to highlight some of the points that I want to mention. So let me first take the Large Hadron Collider because, uh, you know, this is a project which is more recent and all of us are familiar with it. Now, the science goals of this project uh, uh, is already written up there, so I won't read it. And, uh, uh, you know, we often hear that we have discovered the Higgs, which we have, and it uh, resulted in a Nobel Prize. And uh, people uh, say that, okay, uh, this uh, Higgs is the one which gives mass to everything, which is true. But uh, there is something else that I would also like to mention that, you know, uh, if we go back into the history, uh, you see, the standard model of particle physics is something where the mass generation came from uh, a process called spon spontaneous symmetry breakdown. And it was, and this, uh, you know, this notion or this technology of spontaneous symmetry breakdown had to be invoked because it was only spontaneously broken uh, gauge symmetries which were renormalizable. This, this condition of renormalizability has been very important because otherwise we cannot make sense out of the quantum field theories. And uh, so, in fact, because of these such theoretical considerations that this model was built, and it is so nice that after so many years, uh, the Higgs particle has been discovered. So in some sense, it is, um, uh, you know, it is a, um, uh, it is a victory of uh, uh, this strong theoretical beliefs that we have, which uh, nature seems to follow. Uh, and um, so this is something which is not often highlighted. It is said that, okay, it generates mass masses for all the particles, which is true. But um, so I thought I'll mention this. So we have discovered the Higgs um, particle at the Large Hadron Collider. We have discovered quadruple plasma. But more than that, we have discovered some 50 new hadrons. 50 new strongly interacting particles where, you know, with, uh, consisting of four quarks or even more quarks. So this is something which is very interesting. Then it has put important bounds on other things, on the compositeness of these elementary particles, on, you know, these extra dimensions, supersymmetry and so on. And the Indian scientists have made important contributions to these things. Uh, and the story hasn't ended yet. So these are just some of the very top line scientific investigations in the world, uh, top of the line. And uh, when we talk of technology, um, and when I say that, I mean only Indian in-kind items, and it's a huge project, and it has lots of technologies. But we have supplied large number of components for constructing the Large Hadron Collider, and uh, which includes this PMPS jacks. I mentioned this. This may not be one of the most sophisticated uh, ones, but the entire LHC sits on Indian jacks. So the entire tube and everything sits there. Uh, PMPS stands for uh, Precision Monitoring uh, Magnet Positioning System jacks. Then we have supplied normal and superconducting magnets. We have supplied components of various detectors, uh, the photon multiplicity detector in the ALICE project. In fact, the idea to have such a direct, uh, detector emanated from our theoretical work done mostly at Calcutta and Prasaraha is on our audience right now. He's one of the people. Then we built this PMD first in the RIC uh, at BNL. Then we also built it uh, for the WA, WA, WA93, WA98 experiments at CERN and then in ALICE. Then this MANUS, which is an ASIC chip, was built for our muon detector in LHC, but it, it functioned so well that it was used in uh, other parts of uh, the ALICE detector also. We have built silicon strip detectors, and this way we started the silicon strip detector making uh, in BHEL. So uh, something got transferred to the, uh, to the industry also. And then uh, there's resistive plate chambers, which is another detector, and which became, uh, when, which would be used in INO when it comes up. 
then these gem detectors and so on. So as a result of all this, there are a large number of design and production facilities in various labs and industry which have come up. And they have also fed back into the national programs like the INO I mentioned. Then because of our experience in designing superconducting magnets, it helped us in designing our own superconducting cyclotron, the coming uh, radioactive ion beam and the Spelacian neutron source, which will be coming up. We have got a lot of technology and components, etc., from CERN. So as a result of all this, what happened when we started, we were a collaborator in CERN, then we became an observer. And from there, we became an associate member on, uh, in fact, uh, at the, in the financial year 2016-17. And today, uh, because of our being an associate member, we can bid for open tenders um, um, you know, put out by CERN and 49 Indian industries have participating in their market surveys and 17 have qualified and they have about half a million, half a million dollar worth of orders. Still small, but it takes time. Now, uh, one thing which I would like to point out that uh, the building of the uh, LHC also got delayed by several years uh, because of technological challenges on the way. And once it started in 2010, uh, there, was unfortunate, there was an unfortunate leak, which in, which in fact uh, pushed the real commissioning by another year. So this is something which I thought I'll point out. Then uh, we come to this uh, facility for anti-proton and ion research. Now, we were, you know, we are an associate member in CERN. We started as pure collaborator, but in FAIR, we are a founder member country. We are 3% MAF. Uh, partners in the FAIR project. Uh, so we are uh, part of the decision making in all aspects of the project and Indian industries can bid for all open tenders put, put out by uh, or put up by FAIR. Now here uh, the science aspects, um, it's a very, multi, uh, FAIR actually aims at a multifaceted physics program. It will look at a nuclear matter at high densities and moderate temperatures. See what happens in uh, LHC is that we look at matter at very, very high temperatures, but low densities. And the other end of the spectrum is what we look at the nuclear neutron stars, where we have very low temperatures, but very high densities. Now, FAIR will look at in between the nuclear matter, uh, the behavior at you know moderate temperatures and high densities than LHC. So it is complementary to LHC in that sense. Then it will do nuclear physics with radioactive ion beams. This is a very important area. And most of the information or knowledge about nuclear physics that we have comes from uh, you know nuclei you know, stable nuclei but as we all know uh, before uh, we settled on stable nuclei in the uh, nuclear synthesis which took place in violent uh, astronomical phenomena uh, you know passed through several radioactive uh, you know, uh, the, the several stages in between involving radioactive ions. So studying radioactive uh, ions and their properties uh, is very useful, uh, very important for studying the nucleosynthesis in nature. Then we will look at, um, you know, uh, the strong interaction physics in hydronization regime. Uh, in LHC, we are looking at essentially a microsecond after the Big Bang when this quark gluon plasma, everything took place. But FAIR will look slightly later when these quarks and gluons, um, you know, get confined and form hadrons. So it, it will look at that regime. Then it will look at quantum electrodynamics in strong fields, highly stripped heavy ions, and so on. It will look at plasma physics, material science. So it's a very rich physics program, which is largely complementary to the Large Hadron Collider physics. Now here, uh, India is again supplying a lot of in-kind items. Now, one of the big ones is the power converters. There will be about 700 of them of different kinds. Now, uh, uh, and they are really uh, top of the line once again. I mean, power converters with this kind of range in voltages, currents, and, uh, and stability have not been designed uh, so far. We have already supplied, some, uh, supplied over 100 of these items, and they are functioning very, I mean, they have tested very well. Then we are supplying some very specialized vacuum chambers and beam stoppers. Uh, this is something where, you know, a lot of the beam gets stopped and a lot of energy gets um, uh, deposited in a very short time. It's a very challenging piece of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, instrument there. And in fact, um, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, the CSIR lab, Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute, scientists actually designed it. And uh, our German colleagues were so happy about it, such a good design. And now we'll be producing it and submitting it uh, and um, supplying them. Then uh, we will be, uh, uh, you know, close to 200 uh, kilometers of power cables, uh, then uh, some detector components. So once again, uh, this has built design and production capacity in labs and industry. And once again, these will feed into national programs like high brilliance SRS, RIB, etc. See, I must mention that though these projects are very different, LFC is different, fair will be different, but there, there are, uh, you know, items of generic kinds. And there are magnets all over, there are power converters all over, there are cables of different kinds. And obviously, they they become more and more sophisticated successively as we uh, ramp up the specifications. But the capacity that we build, the things that we learn in one project, uh, is, uh, becomes useful for the other project. Now, once again, I point out, I mean, all of you would wonder why am I pointing uh, these things out, but I'll come to that later slightly. This project has also got delayed because what happened that after Fukushima disaster, the safety regulations, the fire safety regulations in Germany got considerably tightened. So it turned out that all the civil designs which had been thought of for building this facility were no more um, uh, sufficient. And so everything had to be redesigned. So this has led to considerable cost escalation and a seven year time delay. But uh, the project is now going on in full swing as per the uh, revised time schedule. And we hope to have the first beams in 2025. Now, uh, then I have put two projects here on this slide and, uh, uh, you know, deliberately. First one is this LIGO India project. Now, once again, you know, as you all know, uh, the uh, discovery of a gravitational wave 100 years after Einstein's general theory of relativity has opened up an entirely new window and gate to astronomy. This is gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, one of the easiest ways to understand this, that this is the only way we'll be able to, in some sense, look at black holes and black hole related phenomena, because other things are not visible there anyway. So, uh, and this project involves a whole range of very sophisticated technologies. The detectors will be supplied by the LIGO consortium uh, because this, uh, the th this is the third observatory in the series. You know, there are two in the US, in Hanford in Washington and one in Louisiana, and this will be the third one. So the detectors have to be identical. So that will be supplied about 500 million US dollars worth of detectors. That will be supplied by the U.S. side, but we have to build the rest here and put the detector in there. Now, this is considered to be the uh, largest uh, ultra-high vacuum envelope by volume in the world. This requires very high stability lasers, advanced optics, and vibration isolation by 14 orders of magnitude. Because the kind of displacement that you measure in LIGO is 10 to so minus 18 meter, or 10 to so minus 19 meter. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Uh, you know, the kind of things that we are measuring. So uh, vibrations have to be completely isolated. Then advanced controls, quantum metrology, and so on. Now, India, you know, this thing has come to India because in choosing, uh, choosing uh, a site in India gives a long baseline uh, for these detectors. And that will help localize the gravitational wave sources uh, in much more precise a fashion because of triangulation. In fact, it's an orders of magnitude improvement. And that is why uh, this uh, project, that's one of the reasons why this project has come to India. So, uh, so you know, in certain cases, uh, the site becomes, uh, uh, you know, a positive point for us. And uh, that's why I have put the next one, the National Large Solar Telescope. Now, this place, Merak in Ladakh, and it's on the Indian side of the Pangyong Lake. And it's considered either, if not the best, the second best site for solar astronomy in the world. So once again, we have an advantage because of site. And it's because of the large lake there and uh, the mountains there, there's such a good site. And 
the other uh, four meter plus solar uh, telescope which is coming up or which has already been commissioned is in Hawaii. So if we have one solar telescope in Ladakh, then we will have the longitudinal advantage and that will um, afford the astronomers around the clock uh, uh, observation of the sun. Because when, when it is night in Hawaii, then it is day here and so on. So this project got initially delayed for want of necessary clearances because, as you realize, it's on the uh, Indian side of Pangyong Lake. Uh, so Security-wise, we needed clearances. So, uh, But we finally, we got clearances, and now we are waiting for the financial sanction. So these two projects tell us that in, if the site is on, you know, if, there are uh, projects, there are physics of certain kinds where site is important, and we may have an advantage. Now, uh, this uh, INO, which is now called Puttipuram Research Center, this will, you know, this project has got uh, delayed quite a lot. Uh, this was, in fact, this would have been the only project in the world of its size where we would have measured neutrino and anti neutrino interactions separately, and we would have actually uh, been uh, one of the, we would have been the first ones to make. Uh, many of the measurements, but now this project has got considerably delayed because of opposition by the local population. And uh, they have a mistaken notion that this project is dangerous because there is apparently some confusion between neutrino and neutron. And uh, this has gotten into some legal complications and so on. Uh, it has still not been given up uh, because there is a, uh, the experts believe that the physics is so important that it will still be important to do this project. And then it will be important to have a world-class underground laboratory for other studies in physics, biology, or geology, etc. Now here, you know, as I had mentioned just a few minutes back, the RPC detector technology from CERN became very important, and that will be the detector which will be used. So we see an example where a participation in international project has led uh, to, um, I mean, has helped us build a national project. Now, this 30-meter telescope I have put on this same slide. Now, once again, here we are a founder member country, about 10% partner. And uh, this will be a 30-meter segmented mirror telescope where there will be 492 segments of 1.44 meter, you know, end-to-end, -end, you know, hexagonal segments, and which will all be put together and they will function as one uh, mirror, uh, something that we are seeing in this uh, James Webb uh, telescope at a much smaller size. And it's a very important project. India has got very important um, uh, in-kind items to supply. But once again, this project is seeing a considerable delay. It's already delayed by about 10 years uh, because of opposition by local Hawaiians, because of some cultural reasons and so on. Efforts are on to you know, convince them. Uh, in between La Palma and the Canary Islands and Mediterranean has been identified as an alternate site. And uh, now the cost of the project has gone up uh, by about a billion dollars. So efforts are on to bridge the huge funding gap. So I put these two projects here because once again, we see that uh, sometimes these projects, and in case of TMT, we had all the court um, uh, decisions in our favor. Even then the project cannot go on. So sometimes you end up in uh, problems in such projects which are beyond uh, our control. And so was the case with FAIR where it was a regulatory thing that was a problem. Okay, so now let me, after all this, let me rush now a little bit. So if I look at the um, size of the Indian Mega Science Enterprise, I mean, this is something, uh, This it looks something like this. Now, don't um, pin me down on these numbers, but it gives an order of magnitude uh, feeling, feel for uh, the kind of how big this enterprise is. So there are about 700 scientists, about 300 PhD students, 150 institutions, 100 industries. We have supplied a lot of large, a lot of in-kind items. We have also supplied manpower for testing and commissioning of components. We have built institutional and industrial capacity in all these high-tech areas. And many of these technologies are feeding back into our national facilities. And uh, the science you know, highlights, there are lots of them, but I just put three of them, which I have already talked about, Higgs, Wolverine, Plasma. And the discovery of gravitational waves. So the project is not the main project is yet to be sanctioned uh, very soon. But even then, the discovery paper on uh, gravitational waves 
had 37 Indian scientists from nine Indian institutions. And um, so it's a you know a big tribute to our scientists uh, that they have been with this gravitational wave astronomy for a long time and they have made such important contributions. Then uh, AstroSat has been launched at about 200 PhDs, 1500 papers, and these are these, these are the kinds of outputs that you know are there. Okay, so now now I come to uh, more of the management challenges in managing this mega science project. Now, any, each of these projects, any of these projects goes through typically four phases. First, what I'll call early consultative and preparatory phase, where we, people look at the conceptual design in very great detail. They try to do the costing decision on national, whether it should be national or international, IPR sharing issues, cost sharing issues, project management structure, international negotiations, international agreements, site decision, regulatory clearances, etc. All this is done. And in fact, the conceptual design report, which FAIR had, ran into 16 volumes. So, and by some of the best minds in the area. So, okay, you look at the earlier designs, you look at the extrapolation of it, you look at the volume of it, the weight of it, and you try to come out with a costing and conceptual design, which is as realistic as possible. But you fall short of, you stop at that state, because after that, engineering design and prototyping will require much larger cost inputs. So the first stage. The second is the design R&D and prototyping phase. The third one is the construction and commissioning phase. And fourth is the operation maintenance and augmentation phase. The typical timelines are about 10 years for the first two phases, 10 years for construction and commissioning, 20 to 50 years of operation maintenance and augmentation phase. I mean, as you all, as we all realize, the LHC started in 2012. And it is expected to give data till 2035 as of today. Uh, TMT uh, is, will have over 50 years of operation time once it is built. So that's the kind of thing. What are the typical costs? The construction costs are typically a few billion dollars. I mean, uh, LHC was about five billion dollars, but ITER is a little more expensive, 20 billion euros. And the James Webb telescope, which has gone up, there is about 10 billion dollars. And operation costs are typically about 10% of the construction costs, typically. Now, there are a lot of cost uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Even when you have designed everything and, you know, there are some inflationary uncertainties. Okay, you know the inflation, but then the inflation is not uniform. Sometimes, you know, there's the inflation in metals. Because most of this is, uh, these things are ultimately metals, iron and copper and so on. The inflation in metals actually varies you know, wildly at times. So that is an uncertainty. The technological uncertainties, I mean, okay, you have designed, you, you know the specifications based on uh, uh, your past experiences and everything that you know of, you come up with some kind of a cost. But then until it is designed and built, uh, you know, the real challenges don't come to the fore. And this is a genuine problem because it doesn't exist off the shelf. Uh, so that introduces some uncertainties. Then regulatory uncertainties, I pointed out in case of FAIR, certainly the regulation uh, got tightened and then the design had to be redone. And then other, other unexpected uncertainties like at, um, you know, in Hawaii or in INO, uh, these are all, uh, and they all lead to time uh, escalation and the cost escalation. Then the expenditure is largely capital expenditure when, we're, when we are building it. But all these projects involve large upfront investment, but they are utilized by a very large number of scientists over 30 years or more. So this is also a feature of these projects. Then there is this large number of authors and publications. Uh, so, uh, I mean, poor guys and uh, you know, who work for these projects, they are often questioned that how do we know how, what is, what is your contribution? But over a period of time now, they have come up with a system where you know, uh, various scientists write uh, notes on their contribution in a particular paper that is also peer reviewed why, you know, widely in the collaboration and everything. And then that forms part of a paper. So as the scientists now actually will give you a list of those notes, etc., and they say, okay, though my name figures in all these papers, um, um, you know, uh, this is the work that I have contributed to. So they have been able to solve this problem in some manner. You see, the reason is that 
the data which comes out of these projects actually belongs to everyone. I mean, that is something uh, that's more of a uh, you know question of ownership of the data because people have uh, put in money and effort and time, uh, so they would like to own the data, um, uh, and that is why uh, you know the entire collaboration's name is there. So this issue, there are issues of this credit sharing, which I think have been largely solved. Okay, now I come to the mega science projects management in India. Now, we, how do we choose uh, which projects to participate in? Uh, this is actually a purely scientific community exercise, and they, are, they have been called by different names over, a, over uh, various decades. It started in the ninth plan period, and uh, now they are called vision meetings or vision uh, exercises. And as uh, Prithviraj mentioned in the introduction, we, uh, the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor has undertaken the latest Mega Science Vision 2035 exercise, which is on, and then we'll be able to see this report shortly. Now, uh, these uh, projects in India are uh, multi-agency involvement. And uh, now I wanted to point out to you that it, uh, you know, this multi-agency involvement is quite natural in these projects uh, for two reasons. One, the very structure of the Indian SMT establishment um, makes it inevitable that these projects are multi-agency projects. Because the project implementation skills for these large projects largely lie with mission agencies, which are Atomic Energy, Space, and DRDO. But the scientific community, which needs to be mobilized, the large scientific community, those people actually belong to uh, in, uh, the institutions of Ministry of Education, UGC, other SMT agencies like BST, DBT, CSIR, Earth Sciences, state governments, etc. So they also have to be brought in. So these other agencies have to come in also. Then if we have, uh, you know, we tie up with industries, if there are policy issues, then Department of Heavy Industries, the DPIIT, Industrial Chambers, etc. come in. Then international relations are a very important part of these projects. So MEA is a natural partner. Then uh, I mentioned in many cases there are security aspects, the Minister of Home Affairs and Minister of Defense also come in. So the, because of the very structure of Indian SMT establishment and our allocation of business rules as they are called in Government of India, um, the multi-agency involvement is in, inevitable. But I would also like to argue before you that it is also desirable to have multi-agency involvement. Why? Well, first of all, in funding, since we require large funding, uh, so we need various agencies to chip in, but uh, well, you, one can say that it's all government of India money, so it can it can come from ten pockets or only one pocket. Okay, that's one part. But you know, uh, if when different agencies contribute, it ensures real partnerships because there are also these different expertise, you know, which uh, lie with these different agencies. So if, if they all chip in, if they come in, it actually ensures real partnerships. Unless you know you contribute something hard cash, then, you know, your interest isn't there as much. Now, because different agencies come in, it brings in concerted management and decision-making skills. Now, as I have, I think I have already convinced all of you that there are inherent uncertainties in these projects. So when different agencies with complementary skills and expertise sit together, um, you know, it brings in that much extra expertise to handle these uncertainties. And uh, for the same reason, when these projects go to the cabinet or elsewhere for approval, when there are more than one, there is more than one agency, it instills that much greater confidence among the approving authorities. And in impl implementation, multi-agency involvement is ma almost manifest because of all the scientists and engineers, technicians belong to institutions of different agencies. Okay. Now, uh, now, in, uh, while managing these projects in India. There is uh, this concept of lead agency. Uh, every project, uh, so among all these agencies, one agency is identified as a lead agency, which does all the hard work with the assistance of the others. Then every project is a lead scientist. It is, uh, the, he or she is known by different names, project director, program director, project coordinator, spokesperson, and so on. Uh, then there can be one or more lead institutions who, which do, I mean, uh, the captaincy. Then uh, uh, there is a multi-agency project management structure which is put in. And there's an apex level interagency steering committee co-chaired by the secretaries of all the ministries and agencies. Then there's a project management board which has officials as well as scientists. 
Science Management Board, which also has officials, but fewer officials and more scientists. Then there are other technical advisory committees which look at, you know, each uh, the nitty gritty of each and every uh, component and so on. And uh, the financial approach and fund flow, you know, with all the technical evaluation is done jointly by all the agencies, but the approval, etc., is done by the lead agency following its processes. Now, you know, all of us may feel today that all oh, these things are very simple, but let me tell you, these, uh, in order, it took up more than a decade for these concepts to sink into the governmental system. And I don't know if Professor Ramurti has been able to join. It was he and later Dr. Ramasamy who was who also said he will join today. Uh, you know, um, in, in whose under whose leadership all these structures uh, were put in place. Uh, so, it, I mean, you know, these projects were new and of different kind, and so they we needed a different management model. And I think by this time these concepts have sunk into the management and government government management system. Uh, ma governmental management system, sorry. Then uh, other principle which was decided that we will be making largely in-kind contributions in case of international projects because then at least the money gets spent in India and then it uh, you know builds in capacity in institutions as well as in industry, it generates employment and so on and it helps our national projects so we will not give cash. Then uh, the international agreements, after all the approvals, cabinet approvals, etc., is also signed by the lead agency on behalf of government of India, and other agencies are all in, um, you know, in tune with it. Then uh, you know there are some other issues which were quite contentious and took some time to sort out. For example, how many mega science projects should one scientist participate in at one time? This was a very difficult decision, um, but ultimately it was agreed. You know, these projects, you know, at any given time, there are projects which are on the drawing board in the conceptual phase. There are projects which are being built. There are projects which are given data. Now, if uh, a, a scientist has students, you know, who will get a PhD. Now, how does the student get a more wholesome training? So it was decided that every scientist will participate in two projects at one time, one which is being built one which is getting data, on the, giving data so that their students get a more wholesome training. And this took quite some time to, uh, you know, uh, to agree on. I and mean, this uh, principle took quite some time to agree on. Then, uh, you know, uh, since these projects are such, lo such long-term projects, in between there are uh, newer scientists and groups who, who want to enter. So how do they enter? How do we evaluate? Because this is not typically, you know, that you give a call and you get 100 projects. And you reject ATN, and you know these are more cooperative and collaborative projects rather than competitive projects in that sense. There is competition, but uh, not in the same sense as any other individual scientist-centric projects. Okay, now uh, now I come to you know uh, some usual critiques of mega science projects, and I will try to answer some of those to the best of my ability. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So the first question uh, which is asked is why do we need mega science projects and uh, I think I should have convinced you by now that we have good reasons and essential I mean the first and foremost is that underlying science needs such tools to make further progress I mean it is science which dictates why did we build bigger and bigger accelerators because we wanted to go deeper and deeper into matter to look at what is inside so it is science which tells us that we need these instruments and uh, not for any other reason. Then we answer some of the most fundamental scientific questions asked by human civilization. And this is in some sense a responsibility to our future generations. Then we'll, in these projects, we'll look at extreme physical conditions, you know, very, very high temperatures, very small distances, very large distances, you know, um, and so on. So these uh, instruments, these are essentially instruments, they uh, require extreme technological complexity. Now, these tools really cannot become available to an individual researcher or even a nation on its own. That's why we need to collaborate. And these projects help uh, nurture collaborations among scientists where individual efforts are not enough. So it spreads this culture. It promotes multi-agency, multi-institutional, multinational collaborations. And um, so all these things uh, uh, require that we uh, have these mega science projects and they are beneficial. 
Now, uh, if someone asks me the question, have these mega science classes advanced our understanding of the structure and the functioning of the universe? The answer is an emphatic yes, and I think I gave you some examples. And uh, I mean, let us look at the standard model of particle physics. I mean, I was just trying to count. I think it uh, it had, you know, it had I think four Nobel prizes uh, uh, to it. Uh, um, you know, the, the Glacier Salam Weinberg, then we had uh, Tuft and Weltmann, then we had Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer, and then we had this Higgs and others. So, I mean, these are uh, some of the top of the line science projects that we have in the world. Okay, the next question we are asked why should one invest such large resources in, in these projects? Uh, well, uh, the first I have already said, these are just some of the top of the line science projects. Then there are some collateral scientific returns. Returns. Now let me mention one particular example from India. You see, we um, in non-accelerator particle physics, in cosmic ray kind of, uh, research or gamma ray astronomy, you know, we have an UT, uh, you know, we have an array in UT. We have a muon array there as part of the grade three. Now uh, it so happened that our colleagues from Bose Institute, you know, Professor Raha and his uh, collaborators had got an inkling from their campaign measurements in solar eclipse that perhaps there is, you know, this transient weakening of magnetic fields uh, uh, because of solar flares, which, in, you know, which uh, affects the muon counts. So this was systematically followed by scientists in TIFR and Bose Institute and other places, Aisha Pune and so on, um, using this array. And now this array was built for gamma ray astronomy. And ultimately, they, it turned out that this is true and there's a transient weakening of Earth's magnetic field due to solar flares, which has a lot of... And the, in fact, this paper had larger number of hits than the Higgs paper. So what I'm trying to say that, you know, you build these instruments for a large, you know... Uh, okay, you build them for some very important scientific goals. But for example, large hadron collider, it is looking at, uh, you know, matter and at these temperatures, at these nuclei densities. So who knows what? I mean, uh, we know, we expect certain things. Um, uh, they may be there, may not be there, but something else may be there. So I think uh, it is a very important thing in any scientific research. Then we get technological spin-offs um, uh, in yet unknown technologies. I mean, uh, let me just quickly give you two examples. Uh, the World Wide Web came from CERN, which has really revolutionized the way we communicate and we do business today. And in fact, this touch screen on our phones, etc., also came from uh, some developments in CERN at one time. There's a large array of these technologies. It brings in high-tech manufacturing and industry, high-tech employment. And um, I must say that mega science projects are increasingly rare examples where scientific instrumentation still gets done. I mean, in most areas of science today, instrumentation uh, doesn't get done by scientists. I mean, they design the systems. The equipment is bought, uh, you know, from the market and then the science is done. I'm not saying it is not important, but in these areas, we can't do this because we need to design our instruments ourselves because we are pushing the limits of uh, uh, the instruments themselves. And then, you see, when we are looking at the investments in these projects, we have to look at the long term returns from these projects as a whole. So we, uh, we have to look at the per scientist per year investment over the entire life cycle of a project. So we shouldn't say, okay, it took us 3000 crores to build, but it once built, it will give us data for 30 years by you know thousands of scientists. So um, I think we need to cast our uh, critique of these projects in the right uh, uh, frame of reference. Now, the next question, why can't we build such projects on Indian soil? Uh, yes, we can, we should. And we will be building, but obviously when we are spending this kind of money, the, uh, choosing the best site is important. It has already started happening on Indian soil. Uh, the GMRT we have built long back. MACE has been built. LIGO will be on Indian soil. The National Large Solar Telescope will be on Indian soil. Then we are talking about high, high, high brilliance synchrotron radiation source, etc. and so on. Um, so then... Uh, we per, uh, there is also a time for greater international participation in some of the projects that we build in India. Okay, so this is the last but one slide that I have. So once again, uh, if I have to summarize, and this is in some sense also the prospects for these mega science projects, 
Now, okay, uh, once again to repeat, we embark on mega, mega, mega science projects because, uh, uh, you know, further adv advancement in certain fields of research requires such sophisticated instrumentation. Otherwise, we cannot do that, do these investigations. Now, India has come a long way since its participation in the building of the Large Hadron Collider and its subsequent utilization. But not everything is hunky-dory. Uh, there's a lot that we need to do. We need to increase the size of sci the scientific and industrial base involved in such projects. Uh, in a country like ours, uh, that size can be substantially increased. We need to increase the footprint of engineering institutions like IITs and CSIR labs and even the, D the DRDO and ISRO labs in our mega science projects further. They are there, but not, uh, you know, um, not in the kind of strength that we'd like them to be in. Then uh, we need to enhance the level of industry participation. See, so far they have, you see, the design is largely done in the R&D labs. And once the design is done, done, they produce them. But I think we need their ha to strengthen their hands uh, to get into, uh, you know, more into design and uh, prototyping and so that we raise their technological level um, uh, and this way they will also be able to compete for global tenders floated by these mega science projects in which we may not even be there. Then, uh, you see, these mega science projects do uh, lead to a lot of technologies which, trans which if translated, could uh, lead to commercialization of useful technologies. I think one case uh, which I must mention quickly is the medical, um, you know, instrumentation. I think, as we all know, the cancer therapy in recent times has com has been completely revolutionized by the entry of, uh, you know, accelerators. You know, first it was uh, with these, especially these hadron uh, therapy machines and so on. So, uh, and now this uh, production of these radioactive isotopes, which you use for diagnostic purposes, they are also produced using accelerators. So, uh, there are a lot of these technology and these gem detectors that I talked about, uh, are expected to revolutionize these medical imaging technologies. So um, I think we need to consciously do uh, something or put in conscious efforts to uh, accelerate these, uh, you know, these activities. So we need to fund such activities for spin-off technologies, and we don't expect the initial funding to be very large. We also need to leverage the experience that we have gained in international collaborations for the benefit of national project pro projects and programs, I already pointed out to several such things. It has already started happening, but um, uh, perhaps a more orchestrated effort is required. Um, so, we uh, the second thing is that we also need to properly phase our national projects and programs uh, because you see it is the national projects and programs which actually sustain the capacity that we build in these kinds of technologies. So they, are, they serve as a reservoir. So, in, uh, you know, we bring in something from abroad, so that is in that reservoir, which we use somewhere else in, uh, nationally. And similarly, if we do something nationally, then we also build that reservoir, which we can use internationally. So I think it's very, very important to build this national capacity by way of concatenating these national projects one after the other, so that we are able to effectively participate in international projects and we can build our national facilities quickly and um, you know competitively now so finally what is the you know what is the prospect uh, how does the prospect look like to me now india has a huge population india has a strong tradition of science so I believe that it must have a global footprint in all areas of science and technology. I mean, if we leave out mega science projects, then we will have to leave out experimental investigations in many areas of science and technology. So that is not something which will be befitting a 1.4 billion strong uh, country with such strong traditions of doing science. Now, uh, we have uh, our in industrial capacity is getting better and better in high tech areas. Our economic performance is getting better and better. So it is very natural for our scientific community to be ambitious. And let's not blame them. Uh, we can only help them to be uh, carefully ambitious. Uh, 
to plan their future regarding mega science projects but it is very natural for them to be ambitious to take part in such front, front ranking scientific instrumentation so my final uh, you know my final feeling or my feeling is that mega science projects are here to stay only questions are which ones and at what scale so i'll end here and thank you and i think i've taken exactly 60 minutes so before i will be happy thank you hello sir you know, yeah. can you take I'll few questions i'll stop sharing now so you can can you take few questions from audience and yeah yeah so uh, have i uh, am i my sharing over now yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay good yeah. good yeah sure why not if i can answer yeah so uh, it's time for questions uh, even people uh, from microsoft teams can unmute themselves and ask questions I mean, try speaking. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, probably it was very nice, very nice, uh, very good uh, talk that you gave and summarized, and that probably one of the best difference I've seen of mega science projects from all angles. Uh, excellent talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I have one comment. Is one of the, when you say the multi, we have of course by in, it's natural that we have this multi agency is coming in and have to join together, hands together, and for this project. For international projects, this has been working excellently. This has worked, as we have seen. Now, I my personal feeling is that for the national uh, MIA projects, this having the inter this interagency involvement has not really come up that much. Uh, I think that this is something we have to think of in the in the future project that we are going to have in, in the national projects and bringing in international teams as well. That there should be some kind of a coordinating. A little bit of more coordination will be required between the agencies than has been existing so far. What is your, uh, what will be your thought on that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think you uh, you said uh, you said it right. I think one. See, I, I think what is the necessity is the mother of invention. I think in the international right. projects, since they were large, they required considerably larger amounts, sums of money. And so these things came together. And in fact, unfortunately, I don't see Professor Ramamurthy, uh, you know, and Dr. Ramasamy today. They have said they will come. In fact, you know, I, so far these projects were essentially atomic energy and DST. And there was this long, uh, long stint of uh, you know Dr. Chidambaram and uh, Dr. Kakutkar there and Dr. Uh, Ramamurthy here, and then subsequently Dr. Ramasamy, which helped bring in these things. But okay, now coming back to your question, I believe, and I think I argued that uh, multi-agency, uh, you know, efforts are natural because of the structure of our agencies, and because money, if money was the only thing, it can can come from one source. That's not the only problem. You are right. I think um, you know you have been a part of this entire you know kind of stabilization, and I would say that it has stabilized. Um, perfectly. Um, so I think in future we would uh, we would perhaps uh, have uh, structures which will make it a little more uh, you know or uh, systematize this whole business. And I'm only I'm happy to inform you that this Mega Science Vision 2035 exercise. Yes. I mean, as you all know, uh, so this was um, this exercise is done every five six years. The last one was in 2014. So it was limited to only essentially nuclear physics, particle physics, accelerators, and non-accelerator particle physics. Yeah. This time, Professor Vijay Raghavan took it upon himself to do it, and he has enlarged it to include astronomy astrophysics, an exercise which was being done by their Astronomical Society of India. Mm -hmm. So that has also come in, and then he has um, included climate research and ecology and environmental science also. They have been doing mega science without realizing that they are doing mega science, but it is important. So I think one important component in all these reports is these manage, uh, are an, an important aspect are these management uh, management aspects, okay? Right. Which each of these uh, uh, I requested uh, every community to look at these aspects and uh, say what they want. I mean, what exists in practice so far, 
is known to everyone. And if you think that there's something wrong with uh, these models, then what do you think should be done? So I think in these reports, you will see, you have already seen the nuclear physics yes. report. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and in fact, I wrote some preliminary version of this uh, management model, which I sent to all these people. So they have improvised upon it in some manner. So you are right. I think we need, uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't want to give a feeling that everything is, uh, you know, perfect and uh, functioning well. But um, I think we will, uh, you know, we have to get we have to, you know, we have to get into this habit of working together. I mean, as it is, uh, I mean, now that I am also senior citizen, I can uh, take the liberty of making some comments. I mean, we are much too individualistic in this country. But these projects, these kinds of science, cannot be done by an individual. I mean, now we are talking about this uh, next generation synchrotron. Ten thousand crores will be the rough cost ballpark figure. Now, uh, we have not built anything of this kind. Now, how is it going to be built by, you know, one institution or two institutions? It has to, we have to come together. We have to learn how to come together. Scientists have to learn that. Agencies have to learn that. See, even agencies, you know, have this turf war. Yes. Oh, uh, humne, you see, uh, humne paisa diya, naam unka ho gaya. I mean, see, naam, you see, naam is of the country, naam is of the government. And uh, these are different arms of the government. So I think we have to come out of this, you know, and I think I'll just quote Kakodkar, I'm a small man. Uh, Dr. Kakodkar keeps on saying that one of the biggest, uh, most important things these projects uh, teach us is this management, as are these management aspects, uh, the way to collaborate together. Uh, you know, uh, this is an important uh, thing that we learn from these projects. So I think yeah. to answer your question, it was more of a comment. I think we will, imp we will improve as we go along. That's all I can say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Praveen, it was wonderful listening to you. I got a very nice overview. So far, I have been only the ringside observer. I have a specific question. You answered partly in terms of the number of scientists involved, institutions involved, PhDs produced, publications produced. And uh, there's also this cascading or multiplier effect. You know, nowadays everybody wants to know what is the return on the investment. Uh, have you thought about how to quantify this uh, multiplier effect or cascading effect? Okay. Uh, so if I, I, I wonder if I understood the right. Uh, okay. What I have done so far, I mean, this one. See, let us say, let us say, two hundred and seventy PhDs, right? Mm -hmm. They don't just disappear. They are going to take up scientists teaching positions from high end to low end, and then they they then they train the next generation. Yes. Now this nobody considers this when they do the benefit evaluation. Okay. Yes. It's nice to say uh, you know in the Higgs discovery we participated, let a Nobel Prize Lego, over 37 names are there. There is a Nobel Prize, etc. But uh, that is that's fine. That catches the people's imagination. But uh, I have been struggling with this uh, issue. How to quantify this benefit that I took? It is not easy. Yeah. Okay. So now I get your question. Yeah, because so, you have uh, been sitting in your yeah. and ESD and so on. You have looked at it. You must have faced this question before. Yeah, uh, we have. <laughs> I have faced it a lot. And, you know, at times, uh, uh, you know, the two big, uh, I mean, to a great degree of annoyance. But I think it's a valid question. But answer to your question is, I mean, you are looking for an analysis uh, what the Ministry of Earth Sciences did. That, you know, with, with these climate, uh, you know, predictions that they are making, this has given a return to the country of some 60,000 crores or something like that. Because of, you know, uh, sowing at the right time and saving uh, calamities and this and that. So, uh, this was done again by National Council for Applied Economic Research. I do not think we have an analysis of that that I'm done here. What I know are the following facts. One is that uh, the number of institutions has have increased. Okay, when okay, the CERN is the only you know concrete example that we have because you know typical life cycle is thirty years. So you know when I started my career in DST and I retired, so CERN. Let us look at CERN. When we started, there were eight institutions. Now there are close to you know thirty institutions which are participating. Now. Many of the students, uh, uh, um, you know, who participated in, um, 
you know, who were trained from our uh, uh, projects. And then they went abroad. They didn't come straight. And now they have found uh, jobs in some of the best institutions, IITs, ISERs, and so on. So it has started feeding into the system. Now, what we, the data, we all, we have the data from CERN. All these students, where did they go? And most of them went to as postdocs in some of the best places in the world. Few went to the industries also, because in high energy guys, you know, they get a lot of this computing experience. So they went to the industry, but perhaps we would have liked larger number to go into industry. So this data we have, but really converting it into, a, you know, a rupee, you know, what is the rupee return on this? Uh, these economists do it, and we don't, we have not done it. There's another thing which I mentioned, but I did not, I was afraid of quoting that number. But I have done this calculation because this incessant questioning, which I have to fail, that, you know, a lot of money got in. So I took the case of uh, Sir, 1996 to 2019. I took and the, all the money that we had spent. It turns out to be about 925 crores and over 120 scientists on an average at all times and so on so it turned out to be eve and this including the uh, the associate membership so if i include associate membership the sign uh, per scientist per year in uh, expenditure uh, turns out to be about 35 lakhs per scientist per year if i remove that associate membership it comes out to be 25 lakhs per scientist per year something of that kind so this is something which I have done, and uh, this is also not my original theory. In fact, Barry Barish is the one who quotes. He said that you integrate the expenditure over a period of time, divide it by the number of people, and then do this. So that's one thing. But I think it's a very valuable thing, uh, sir, that you are asking. Well, after all, you know, these are the people who are going back. And, uh, you know, they're again training people, and uh, they're going into different sectors. So this needs to be done. We have not done so far, but I think maybe in our vision report, this can perhaps also come in as one item that we should do this in future. We'll have to give it to NCAR or some. They know how to do this. And uh, so, um, uh, and, I, and you know, we have uh, all these years, and Dr. Amitra is here. I mean, we tried so hard to bring in IITs and so on. We found it very hard to bring them in. But uh, now they are evincing interest, partly because some of these guys, now I, IITs have started uh, you know, getting high energy physicists as their professors, which was not the case earlier. So when these people are there, obviously they get interested and they start doing these things. Uh, but, uh, you know, and the other thing which, uh, which is, I have, I'm often asked, okay, this will eat into the R&D expenditure of all the science departments. Now, I do not have the, okay, so far it's only DAE and DST, so it's easier. I have the figures from DST. It's there in annual reports. I'm just looking for the very first year expenditure figure. So from the annual report, it's a public document. I can figure out, I, I can take the DST expenditure, I can take out the establishment expenses, the autonomous body expenses, and then I know what the R&D expenditure is. And then it also gives us the mega science uh, program expenditure. It is nowhere close, sir. Uh, I mean, it is it is a small fraction, 10, 15 percent, not more than that. I, and, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, and let, uh, let me also give you, in the 15th Finance Commission period, when I was before my retirement, in DST, we had a figure of 37, uh, 3,750 uh, crores for five years. So it's about, you know, 700 crores uh, or 800 crores. And um, out of the total DST, uh, you know, budget of uh, how much? 6,000 crores plus, you know, even if we get 5% increase. So how much it is? I mean, it's, it's not something that's going to eat into the whole thing. It's not more than 15, 20%. And the number is actually, that's why I said, you know, these numbers also are not very firm, but gives us some ballpark figure, some idea about the size of this enterprise. So, I mean, clearly it cannot be either or, it has to be both. Yes. Mega project as well as not so mega project. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I have a small question. Uh, this is for all this mega SNT uh, projects. Uh, I find the public acceptance is one important problem. Sometimes it's an impediment. And some of the problems, you gave an example of INO which has been delayed also. So has it been anticipated in uh, making the projects itself? Because you, you mentioned public acceptance as an uncertainty also. But if it has been anticipated, anticipated and the kinds of uh, problems in public acceptance have been already taken into account, the uncertainties would probably be uh, less. Has it been done? Uh, is it is it a routine uh, that uh, that is that such things are taken into account? Yeah. Uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, you know, when you plan a project, you know, when you choose a site, as I said, you know, the very first day you choose a site, you get all the environmental clearances, you do a lot of this public, uh, you know, outreach activities and so on, and uh, you. Um, you do all these things, but even then, you know, it's, it's not a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. I mean, I give you the example of the 30 meter telescope. I mean, all the court decisions in our favor are in our favor. But even then, these, you know, uh, what do you call them? these uh, protesters are sitting on the road, and uh, you know, that's um, that's the United States. I mean, so the use of force is very. You know, very rarely resorted to. So people are talking to them and so on. So the answer to your question is yes, they are taken um, as as seriously as possible and um, all precautions are taken, uh, all known precautions are taken. But then even then you get into these problems. This is, I mean, even in case of FAIR, I think FAIR, one of the reasons is that uh, GSI already existed and it's actually a, an accelerator lab already. Neighborhood. I mean, and that there will be another accelerator is more or less accepted. But even then, there's a lot of there are a lot of a lot of efforts were put in by the fair management because it's going to be a bigger accelerator and so on uh, to get. I mean, to do this public outreach and so on. So, answer to your question is yes. Um, okay, as much as we know, as much as we can. Uh, you know, expect we take all the precautions, but even then, there are problems. And these days, with all the increased, uh, you know, communication and WhatsApp and WhatsApp University, we have greater problems. I mean, what can be more uh, harmless than a neutrino? I mean, a billion neutrinos are passing through my head all the down, you know, every second per square centimeter from sun itself. Nothing happens. But they get confused with the neutrinos and neutrons. You know, you, first we planned it in near Kuti. Then we had to move from there because the environmental clearance had a problem. Uh, okay, the project had not been sanctioned at that time because there was an elephant movement in that path and so on. So we moved. But when this project got sanctioned, all the environmental clearances, etc., were in hand. In hand, even then, people went to court, challenged this technicality and so on. So, okay, we. I mean, we have, and this, the reason why I mentioned all this will be another criticism. Of these projects, but I mean, I hope I have been able to convey that these are—I mean, these scientists are as honest, as uh, upright, as uh, conscientious as any other scientist. And they, in their own field, they are some of the best in the world, and they try to do their job. But okay, well, you get into these problems. So. Now, when a, when a problem gets politicized, it's very difficult to deal with that. That's what happened to IMO. Yeah. I will not say more than that in public. I have a question, sir. Short, short question. Yes. Yeah. Regarding the medical isotope production, want to yes. increase the dependence on the fission reactors. So, country is is country not going in a big way to produce accelerators for the like we are importing many proton accelerators. Is, is I would I would request Dr. Amit Roy to respond. I think he is more knowledgeable. Uh, to respond to this. Well, yes, uh, certainly. So, see, for example, already we have some cyclotron, and one cyclotron, medical cyclotron is operating in, in Kolkata for uh, producing pipettes, uh, isotopes, which are and commercially also they are available. So, they are, the number of the, uh, such uh, units are, are already working in the country, small cyclotrons, which produces these isotopes, some of the isotopes, not all. 
and this Calcutta medical cyclotron will produce much more, more than the fluorine one. The gallium isotope also will be produced, which is used for prostate cancer treatment. And uh, of course, there is a linear, linear accelerators also. Large linear proton accelerators are coming up, two of them. One is in Tata Institute, uh, the Tata Memorial Center in, uh, in Mumbai, Navi Mumbai. They're, they're setting it up. And one in uh, near Chennai. I think Apollo hospitals also are getting into that. So these the things are in progress. Uh, it, it takes time uh, to such, get such things. And yes, we haven't yet developed some medical some medical uh, accelerators in the country yet. But some of the one good thing has happened in the past is that the Samir has taken a lead in making an electron ac linear accelerator, which is for the uh, radiation treatment for a normal cancer radiation treatment that they have started. So things are in progress. Good evening, sir. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, this is Dr. Vivek. So, um, yeah. I, I'm from Deni, uh, Chinnamunu, which is uh, 10 or 15 kilometers from Potipura. Yeah. So, I'm asking this question out of curiosity. In fact, I got this information from one of the WhatsApp universities. So, uh, yeah. people over there, they strongly believe, like, it's, it's not uh, only the difference, they're not able to differentiate between neutrons and uh, neutrinos. Uh, the, the other thing that we get from the universities, what some universities is, uh, it's, it's not good for, it's like, it's uh, very bad for, uh, sorry, it paves the way for uh, groundwater depletion. I've seen many farmers leaving this place, like, like once it used to be a very fertile land, and I've seen many farmers selling their uh, lands at the cheaper cost, and, and it's very hard to see uh, that land going very barren now, in the last uh, three, four years at least. So is it really true? Uh, uh, look, I mean, I do not have the exact information on these things but i would only say that since the environmental clearance etc have been you know given okay these these things should have been examined so um, uh, i think we do not proceed with any project unless we have the environmental clearance which looks at all these things so but i think uh, for more uh, uh, you know more precise information on this i think you'll have to contact the project team in tifr and they, they should be able to tell you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I think if there are no more questions, we will thank Dr. Astana. That was a wonderful presentation and very interesting discussion after the talk. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice, nice to see you, Satyamurti, again. <laughs> And uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a pleasure and a privilege. It's a pleasure. It's a, it's a it's really enjoy. Very much enjoy. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.